evening um, with me. All right, so um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're gonna talk about 10 lessons from building a business that's big enough. And that is a book that I wrote um, a little, or published a little over a year ago. And I think that the, the subject matter is something that I think is hopefully more relevant than ever. Um, I think a lot of people are going through the great resignation and really starting to think differently about what's possible and what's the next thing for their lives. But I wanna start off, um, you know, talking a little bit about you or recognizing you and saying that I understand that you're probably um, entrepreneurial people or people who have real business experience and have lots of business ideas. And my goal is not to teach you anything about business necessarily. My goal today is really to inspire you and to maybe help you see some opportunities or some ideas that you haven't considered before that are what I think unconventional, that aren't the normal things you hear from business people who are focused on getting rich quick or hustling for you know, 20 hours a day. This is a different kind of perspective. So I wanna get started uh, talking <laughs> about me um, and telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I uh, have two dogs uh, and, and a wife too named Sachi, we'll meet her in a second, but I like to start off with our dogs, maybe, and Piper, uh, they are Bernadoodles. And that means they are a mix of Bernese Mountain Dog and Standard Poodle. They're a big part of everything we do. Um, I grew up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I mentioned on the way in that uh, I'm from the Carolinas. And uh, in 1998, I moved to the Pacific Northwest to Seattle. And today I live in a place called Orcas Island, which is 55 square mile island um, off the coast of Washington State between Seattle and Vancouver. And we live here on the island. We've lived here since 2019 permanently. And uh, now it's our permanent home and it's a, it's a place we love. Uh, you can't get much for, further Northwest in the continental United States than here. And we are actually looking at uh, Canada in the background here, especially on the right side, that's Saturna Island. So I'm as, I'm as far Pacific Northwest as I can possibly get. And I love it. That's something that um, is a big part of my life as being um, a Pacific Northwestern person. So, Enough about me. We're here to talk about business. Uh, that doesn't sound that exciting, maybe, but um, I think you'll find that this is a different perspective. Uh, I want to start with just talking a little bit about the current state of the business that I run, and that will provide some context. Um, it's called Common Craft, and we've been running it since 2007, and we'll tell that story in just a moment. But today, Common Craft is a web-based company. Every, virtually everything we do happens through our website. And through that website, we offer libraries of media that we create and own. And examples of those, first is a video library of explainer videos that are animated and teach subjects related to academics and technology that are used by educators around the world, school districts, some Fortune 500 companies, and of course, individual teachers. They use the videos in classrooms to help students get on the same page quickly. So we're always building the video and have been for many years. So that's sort of our product. Um, another product is our, um, what we call our cutouts, which is the artwork that appears in our videos that we now offer to customers as a library of over 3000 images so that we can help people create their own creative projects, whether it's videos or presentations or whatever it, whatever it is. And we also do online courses that help people use those products or create their own similar products um, so that they can explain their ideas more effectively. Uh, that includes making animated videos. Another part of that whole thing, as you as you can probably tell, a big part of our, our thing is this idea of explanation. And I published um, The Art of Explanation in 2012 as uh, sort of almost like a manual for professionals to really understand how they can improve their explanations and use explanations, clearer and explanations as a strategic advantage. And then about a year ago, I published my second book, Big Enough. And that's really the focus today. Uh, all the stories that I'm going to tell today are in Big Enough, but with more detail, um, more, uh, more information. Um, it's a short book. It's only 
um, you know, like 175 pages, I think. So you can't have a book called Big Enough and it, it be a big book. So um, <laughs> I hope that's a consideration. Um, before we get started, I want to talk about uh, my wife, Sachi, because she is um, a huge, she plays a huge role in Common Craft and doesn't get a lot of credit because she chooses to stay behind the scenes. But she is really our executive. She's um, one of the, she probably is more of a decision maker than me. She's very analytical and data oriented. And I'm more of the creative director. I do the creative side. She's sort of the business side. She has an MBA, all that. So um, she, you won't see her on screen or really many places online, but I wanted to give her a quick shout out. So we got started in 2007. And I had been an online community manager. I was really into this idea of social media. It was kind of becoming social media at the time. Uh, we were learning a lot about blogs and wikis and social networking. And um, I was enthralled with it all. Like I, I really couldn't get enough of it. And I really wanted people to adopt it. And I started writing blog posts um, in you know, 2003, 2004, when I became a consultant. Uh, that helped explain these things. And then YouTube happened in 2006. And then Sachi joined the company in 2007. And we started thinking, what if we can use video to explain these new tools that are free, fairly easy to use, and can really be transformative for people? And so that's what we did was we started making animated videos in our basement. This was our very first uh, setup. Um, it evolved significantly after this, but this was in 2007. And our goal was to make a video that finally makes something really easy to understand that was formerly being explained in a way that was not so clear. So from the very beginning, we called it whatever technology in plain English. And um, that was our goal, to make it something that our parents could understand and might develop their interest in something like a blog. Um, so we started with putting the videos on YouTube, which was uh, a new resource then. Uh, the videos that we first published were about RSS and wikis and social networking. And, and those videos, to our surprise, um, went viral and very quickly got uh, you know hundreds of thousands of views. Today they have millions of views and really kind of changed our lives in a lot of ways because suddenly we were known as video producers. And you know you saw that picture before, we didn't really have any, uh, any experience in video production, any equipment, any know-how, uh, but we had a lot of passion and a will to experiment. And suddenly we were known as both educators and video producers and had no prior education in that previously. Uh, so it was a real whirlwind um, to see that happen. Um, and so I'm gonna play a video here. I hope that you'll be able to hear this. Um, if you don't mind, let me know in the, um, in the comments there. Let's see here. Welcome to RSS in plain English. Every time you look for something new and it's not there, you've wasted valuable time. This is the old way. Welcome to Wikis in plain English. These four friends are going on a camping trip. They need to bring the right supplies because they're backpacking. Using a wiki, the group can coordinate their trip better. This is the new way. Yay! Real life happens between blog posts and emails. And now there's a way to share. This is Twitter in plain English. Files saved on one computer can now be available on all of your computers and phones automatically. This is the big idea behind Dropbox. All right, so those videos, just those videos are responsible for about 50 million views online on all platforms, including um, the Dropbox website. Uh, so it, it's, um, I think we were, we were able to get a lot of vis visibility early on that, that helped us with all the things that were to come. Um, and one of those things that came very quickly was companies that came to us and said, we would like for you to build or to create an explainer video that explains our product or service in a similar fashion. And, uh, you know, for two people working from home, our first reaction was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? These, these companies think we're professionals. They think we know what we're doing. And, um, you know, we weren't sure what to think. We were just two people at home 
with a video camera we had used um, for travel. And, you know, it was, it was a whirlwind. It was stressful. It was exciting. Um, but in the midst of it all, we started to think about what really matters to us. I think that we were fortunate to have opportunities. We were fortunate to, to have a choice. And I think it was Sachi who first started to take a step back and think about, well, we have multiple options. If we don't choose well, if we don't choose deliberately what options we take, then it could be um, it could impact our future. And we thought, you know, we're a, a married couple working from home. If we are careless about how the business impacts us, it can impact our relationship. And at that point, what is it all for? So that was the driving force for time thinking about what matters, what's possible, what can two people working from home with an inter internet connection do, and how do we make it work for us? How do we, how do we use this opportunity in a way that actually fits with the lives that we want to lead. So that's what led to this idea of big enough. And, and these are the 10 tips that I'll share today from the book. I think that one of the first things to ask yourself, if you're thinking about like how to, how to, how to do a big enough business is think about optimization goals. Um, you, it's easy to think that, you know, the optim optimization goals for almost every business is to make money. Um, but is that always the case? Of course, money matters. I would love to make more money. It's I'm not here to say that making money is a bad thing. I just think that businesses can be optimized in multiple ways. And that often comes down to who the stakeholders are. And I mean, the people who are probably the owners of the business, whether it's one person, a couple or, or a handful of people. And what do they agree the priority is um, outside of, of money? Like, does it have to be money or can it be other things that you're optimizing for? And that's what we realized early on that we really wanted to optimize for other things. And the next step was thinking about how we can apply constraints and goals to our thinking so that we have almost like blinders that help us evaluate opportunities from a very specific point of view. So starting in about 2008, uh, we actually wrote down constraints. And one of the first and biggest was that we would not have employees. It didn't matter what happened. We might work with contractors. We might have freelancers. We might do other things, but we would not have a payroll. We would also remain home-based. We would not have an office. Um, we would focus on business strategies that would allow us to earn at least some passive income. And that was because by being small, in order for the business to grow, especially um, in terms of the finances, uh, passive income would allow the business to grow with our, without our specific hours being used. And we would remain a low overhead business. And if you look at those first two points there, no employees home-based, that's a, that's a pretty good path for being um, low overhead because I think that often it's expenses and costs that a business incurs, which creates the need for growth. And if you can keep those expenses low and that those costs low and have low overhead, then your need for increased revenue that might need employees uh, can be lower. And really importantly, we wanted to focus on lifestyle and happiness. Uh, you know, there again, married couple working from home. We really wanted to protect what we thought was important and we wanted it to be a sustainable business. We didn't want to work ourselves to the bone for two years and then have to do something else because we had grown uh, tired of it or we needed a change. So with these things in place, this perspective, the blinders, the constraints, we started thinking about, well, what are the possibilities? And I think you'll see that a lot of times we were thinking of, we saw something happening in the, in the environment. Some people contacted us asking questions and what seemed like a threat ended up being a, an opportunity. So the first example is that scenario, working with the competition. So what happened here is when we um, first became known as video explainers, um, a lot of other video production companies started to say, hey, we make explainer videos too. And our first thought was, oh, wow, th these are the competition. How are we going to handle this? Some of them are funded better. They have more experience. They might eat our lunch. 
over time if we don't uh, if we don't figure this out because we're a small company we can't really afford to compete in that way so what we did is we we realized we had a first mover advantage so the demand for custom videos was coming to us because we were known as the pioneers of this idea uh, and it was way more demand than we could handle so I went out to some of the best producers who were who were making explainer videos and said, let's make a deal. I can point leads to you through the Common Craft website and you'll pay a monthly fee for having a listing on the site and we'll call it the explainer, I'm sorry, the explainer network. And basically it's a marketplace um, so that any demand that comes to us that we can't serve, we'll point them to the explainer network page your company will be there and you can grow your business this way via a simple flat fee, a flat monthly fee. And again, to our surprise, it, it actually worked. We had up to nine members of the Explainer Network over time. It lasted for many, many years and was very productive for us. But it was also a big lesson for us that it was a lightweight business model because all we had to do was invite new people on or manage those relationships but the business part of it was a simple flat monthly fee. There was no revenue share. There was no complex financial agreements. And um, it was our first taste of revenue that didn't come from our specific videos. It was really using our market position to be able to work with our competitors and help them grow and help us grow at the same time. So, one of the things that was a really big subject of discussion for us early on was the fact that we were making two kinds of videos. We were making videos for companies like Lego and Intel and Microsoft that were their property. We didn't own it. Um, to make more of those videos uh, in a specific amount of time, we would have to hire more people. And we were not into that. So we started thinking, well, we also have these videos over here that are the videos we call original videos that are our property. They're in our copyright and we have the right to reproduce them. Maybe those can be products, right? So we started to see that, that we have two sides of the business and that there was some way that we could turn our videos into a product where we could make a video once and sell it multiple times then maybe that's a way to earn, earn passive revenue so we can separate our time from, uh, from the income. And so what that led to was this idea of licensing our original work. So this idea came from often professionals who came to us and said, you know, I love your videos. I know they're on YouTube, but I want to download a file. I want to have a high resolution version. I want your permission for me to use it professionally because it solves a problem for me. And so this was the first thought was first time we thought like, oh, this is, this is licensing. This is a business model where they would like to do a digital download. Um, so soon after that, we uh, added a system to our website where anyone could come along and download any of our videos with a license for three years. And we had it broken out between individuals and site licenses. And we sold the first video within a few hours. And uh, it was one of those like really exciting times because um, the evidence was scarce. There was not a lot of evidence, but there was something there that we thought could be something in the future. It could grow because at the time, the custom videos were where our income was coming from. This was a tiny portion of our income for the first couple of years, but we really made a commitment to ourselves to continue to develop that model alongside the custom model so that maybe one day we could switch over and do nothing but licensing. And that's where we are today. That's where Common Craft membership is, is that licensing model. So where that led was that the teachers and trainers and consultants who downloaded the videos, um, you know, kind of got tired of them being all individual and a la carte. They were always having to buy a new one when it came out. And they said, if there was some way for me to just to have access to all the videos, that's what we want. Um, so we created a membership service in Common Craft. And that allowed member, uh, individuals and organizations to log into the website, embed and download the videos. 
And that happens on an annual basis. So it's a re recurring annual membership. And one of the things we discovered about that is that when organizations have a subscription or a membership that's a part of their budget, then that, that line item shows up every year. And as long as you're providing a service to them that they are satisfied with, then that recurring revenue can create um, a stream that, that can support the business. And, and that was a really, I think, important part of our evolution was realizing this, this membership, annual, an, annual membership and recurring um, revenue. Um, today, what that looks like is two different basically kinds of plans. One is a streaming only plan and one is what we call a full access plan that allows people to download the videos. And I think that a lot of people who work online would say, wow, you're giving away or you're basically licensing these video files. Can't they just share them with their friends? And the truth is they can, um, not legally. I mean, not that, that you know, they would be, um, they would be violating our agreement, but I think that that is a cost of doing business for us. We want to be able to offer that service to people. And thankfully, a lot of our audience are respectful professionals who do indeed want to do the right thing. And part of our challenge is educating people on what that right thing is. So this is another example of, of um, what looked like a threat being an opportunity. So uh, we were getting uh, lots of uh, visibility of the videos. And a lot of people were becoming fans of Common Craft and, and coming to us and saying, oh, this, I saw this people, these people over here are copying you. You know, these people are copying you. There's copycats out there. What you should do something about this. And I totally get that. And I really appreciate them letting us know. But we had a different perspective on how to handle that. Um, most of the time, the copycats were people who were just experimenting with a new format and we're not trying to be our competition. And we thought, you know, instead of trying to, you know, send a cease and desist or something like that, we thought, well, what if we actually thought differently about this and said, look, this is happening because people want to do it. There's a need there. Can we do something that actually supports that need instead of fighting against it? And what we did is that was where we started licensing common craft artwork, or what we call cutouts. Um, we created the library, which now has like 3,300 images that um, isn't always on library for people to use to make their own common craft style videos and to do to, to use the cutouts however they like. So um, in this case, we were able to take something that looked like maybe competition, looked like maybe a threat and say, actually, no, we're small and agile. We can just choose to do this. Um, and so now we started slowly letting go of what we considered, some considered our sort of look and feel, you know, our, what was special about us, but it was all in the effort to help people, um, you know, make the process of creating something easier. So I mentioned early on that we got started with all this uh, sort of on a whim. It wasn't something that we came to with a lot of background or education, but over a number of years, especially the first four or five years, we were known as um, the original sort of explainers. And I, for one, and Sachi too, really got into the idea of like, well, what is an explanation? Like we, we're getting credit for this. We should, we should understand it. And we developed a lot of expertise around our approach and what works for explanations of all types. And I think for professionals, anytime a professional is passionate and interested in a subject and is learning a lot about it, I think there's an opportunity to funnel that passion into um, the establishing an expertise, connecting your brand, your name with that expertise. And that can be a productive way to get started on something new. And I think writing books is a part of that. Um, so the Art of Explanation came out in 2012 and uh, it was with Wiley and um, it really, is sort of like I mentioned before, a manual for people who are professional communicators to understand um, the skill that can be developed that helps explanations be more understandable. Uh, you know, oh, let me go back one second. Um, and so that that book has been translated into eight languages and continues to be uh, a book that that is is popular among especially professionals who depend on clear communication. Next thing is going with go with the flow. I think that you've seen me talk about 
uh, working with the competition, you know, turning copycats into customers. These are all examples of looking out into the environment, talking to customers and understanding like, where are things going? And thinking, okay, they're, if they're going this way, is that a threat or an opportunity? So what was happening around you know, 2014 or so was a lot of new products were coming online, especially on websites that allowed people to make their own animated videos. An example is uh, Go Animate or Movely. There's a, there's a number of them out there. And we thought, oh, this is democratizing video production. You know, how can we be a part of this? Or is this going to impact us somehow? So um, instead of treating it as a threat, I went out to a number of these platforms and said, hey, we have 3,300. Um, well, at the time, it was probably more like 2,500 cutouts that I can license to you that will help your users be able to create Common Craft style videos inside your platform. And Go Animate was uh, our first partner and is still a partner of Common Craft today. We also made relationships with other platforms who resold Common Craft cutouts and videos. So this is like a distribution relationship um, that worked well. But what I learned about these kinds of relationships, especially reselling, um, is that they're, they can be difficult to get started and then they can go and things look great. And then you receive an email that says, that whole thing we were doing, it's not happening anymore. And then the relationship is over and you really can't do anything about it. So uh, we still have a couple of those going, but um, it was a really valuable lesson to, to get started on that sort of business development side of Common Craft. So I think, I mentioned the Explainer Academy before. I'm a big believer that if you have expertise in something, if you're known for a subject, that it's important to try to get those, those ideas out there. I think that it gives people more trust in you in learning how you do what you do. And hopefully I'm doing that right now in you know, 30 minutes at a time. But that's really the idea behind the Explainer Academy is, is not only giving people resources, but helping them understand processes and tools. And that's what we do at the Explainer Academy, which is online courses. So to close up here, just a couple more minutes, um, I want to go a little bit more high level, talk about some big themes that I think are threaded throughout Big Enough. And, and I hope that maybe we'll stick in your head a little bit. Um, as I mentioned before, I believe overhead is the enemy. If you really want to be small, then you have to have small expenses and small costs. And, and for us, that means working from home, no employees, also just being diligent about budgeting and, and careful with finances. Um, I believe that, that time is the new wealth. I think we're used to thinking of wealth monetarily, and that certainly still applies. But I think that in the future, more and more people will see that the thing that they want most, even more than money, is more time more free time that they can use for whatever makes them happy, whether that's family time or hobbies or faith or whatever it is, um, that, that time is this thing that you can't build up and use in retirement. You have to use it as use it in your everyday life. And that means designing time into your life. And that means designing businesses that help you have time along with money. Um, I mentioned this example before too, choice as a shareholder value. And that means what do the stakeholders want? What other value can a company produce that's not just money? Uh, because that is the, the sort of like basic law of business is that uh, businesses exist to increase shareholder value. Um, you know, what if that value is something other than money? And finally, I'm a big believer, this is something, a, a part of almost everything I do, that lifestyle really matters. I think we only have a certain amount of time on this earth and it's easy to get caught up in entrepreneurship and hustling and I, I, I appreciate that, but I also think that lifestyle really matters and taking the time to find the things in your life that make you happy, that make you satisfied, starting to think about what success means to you that might not have to do with your bank account and optimizing your life for that. I think it's a healthy and productive way to think about your professional life and your business. So I, in the end, I talked about free stocks. So I wanted to quickly sign off with this note. Um, after this is over, we're going to take all the uh, people who attended today, put them in a hat, draw it out, and I will be in touch uh, to announce the winner, winners and, and follow up. Uh, but that will happen in, here uh, this afternoon. But for now, I'm all finished. 
thank you guys so much for coming out. You've got my book website, personal website, and so on. It's been an honor to spend some time with you. Thanks for showing up from all over the world. Um, you can email me at lee at commoncraft if you have any questions or anything else. Thanks so much, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.